it's recording. So um, other than that, I think that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Katie. Enjoy your morning. Thanks, Sue. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen as I wouldn't be anywhere without my trusty presentation. Uh, so yeah, as Sue said, I, this morning I'm going to talk to you about hedgerows and having them in your garden and just some of their general management because whether we want them in just our gardens or in the countryside, in parkland, the same kind of principles apply in lots of ways. And I sometimes think people think have hedgerows as a countryside thing, whereas actually it can be really lovely in your garden too. Oh, I should probably say, I've done so many of these now and I feel like I know everybody so well that comes on these talks. Um, I am the Hedgerow Heritage Project Manager uh, with the Trust and also work in the North Downs BOA. So yeah, I'm all about hedgerows and we've obviously diversified a lot to be able to do lots of digital things, but hopefully we're going to be doing a lot more of the practical work of the project going forward as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So first of all, why have a hedgerow? The first answer is hedgerows are great. You know, they are fantastic for wildlife. They're incredibly pleasing aesthetically. You get all kinds of wildlife that benefits from them. But they also provide lots of ecosystem services for us as well. One of which being a natural block of pollution and removing it from the air. So it can also be really good for our health to have them in our gardens. Um, as fabulous as hedgerows are, hedgerows are really struggling though. Um, it's like over 90% of hedgerows are considered to be in bad condition or degrading and they really need our help. They, they cannot function well without good management and that means interve intervention from us. So why manage a hedgerow? They are this dynamic entity, you know, all of the hedgerows are made up of trees and shrubs which are ultimately trying to become woodland so it's that successional process they are you know as much as we might not always like to admit it they are a man-made habitat like many other habitats like our heathlands and chalk grasslands and moorlands you know we've lost of our big apex predators and herbivores as well as other things and so we have to fill those roles and keep them like hedgerows if that's what we want them to stay as so without good management, they will just continue to grow, they will become trees, and we'll lose a lot of the functions that those hedgerows can provide. So a garden hedgerow, I think sometimes people are a little bit put off by the idea of a hedgerow in their garden. They think maybe they don't have the space or it will need too much management. But I really am here to tell you that it's all very manageable and that there's so many good things that come out of having a hedgerow in your garden. They really attract wildlife. So if you want to attract more wildlife into your garden, I'd say up with having a pond and a water source, a hedgerow will attract so much more in. Uh, not only that, it can help to connect up parts of your garden and which makes it even more appealing to wildlife trying to move around um, in the environment and you know, it through our gardens and suburban and urban areas. And it's a habitat in its own right. So you'll get lots of interest in your garden from it. And, not, and obviously they're so beautiful and a fantastic addition to all gardens, you know, various flowering and interest to your garden, as well as lots of other things. And so here is just a little picture of what I class as the hedgerow in my garden at the moment. So I think sometimes people, again, are a bit daunted by space and things like that. So I've used this one as a kind of typical hedgerow in a garden. It's even got some standing trees. But uh, this is what I have. So this is sort of what I've inherited, this hedge, hedgerow. Um, and it's an ornamental type variety of holly, but it's also got honeysuckle interweave through it. Now, it's not the most diverse hedge. It's not full of lots of native plants, but it is still fulfilling some of those features of a hedgerow. So there are nesting blackbirds in there. The house sparrows flit in and out of it and use it for shelter and to hide away before visiting bird feeders. There's, it's filled with invertebrates at the base. And when the honeysuckle flowers, it'll be providing lots of food source to various invertebrates, which I see using it already. So even though it's not 
the best example of a hedge, it's still able to fulfill a lot of the hedgerow features that you want to see. So it's not about having to go all in. And so building on that, here is a lot of different examples of different hedgerows in gardens. So we've obviously on the far left here, we've got a box hedge. Again, not particularly diverse, it's just one species, not fantastic for wildlife, but you're still going to have invertebrates at the base of that hedge and different things using it. The best video I've ever seen on Gardener's World was foxes bouncing between uh, box hedgerows. So definitely appeal to them in that instance. We've got a very ornamental sort of beach hedgerow of various varieties here. And I think this one on the right is really interesting because again, not necessarily your classic hedgerow, full of maybe ornamental species, but it is linking up that garden and providing a continuous corridor throughout it. And so able to allow wildlife to move more freely through the garden, more invertebrate life, birds will be using it, all sorts. So even though not a pristine example of a hedgerow, still fulfilling those features and offering some interest to wildlife. Here we've got a hedgerow that's very much just forming sort of a blocking and a shielding kind of element. So again, just quite an attractive feature, whereas much better than having like fences and walls potentially. And then this is a nice one. This is again, this is just a privet hedge in, um, in a friend's garden. And I would class this as a really fantastic margin, but it's actually a flower bed that's filled with green alkanet. So your garden hedgerows and margins and various things can fill all kinds of uh, different ways. And then here we've got a very new hedge. So a recently planted hedge. And even in its really young age, you can see that some of it is flowering already, providing that nectar source. And as it grows and matures, and if it's managed well, it's just going to provide more and more opportunities for wildlife. So just some various examples and different ideas for people that might want to have a hedgerow or fulfill some of the functions of a hedgerow in their garden. So if you are really thinking about having a hedgerow in your garden, this is just a few things to consider. It's very much a winter job. So you want to plant in the winter, like no later than March, really. And even March can be pushing it with the, the way our weather is going, you know, with it becoming with drier and drier uh, springs. So you really want to be planting like November, December, January, February time if you are going to plant up a hedgerow. Uh, prepare the ground. So a lot of people like to clear any other um, plants out of the area to stop it competing. Here we haven't done that and this hedgerow is doing very well. You know, we've planted it amongst the grass. Some people will remove all the grass um, and everything. To give your hedgerow the absolute best chance, that is the best way to do it. But I've really included this picture to show that you don't have to do it that way. Like I know a lot of people will kill off and use weed killers and various things the area before they plant a hedge. Um, you don't have to do that. I think just clearing it back and just trying to remove as much competition as possible and then nurturing your hedge is the best way to do it. Choose your plants carefully is a very big one, which I'll just leave that there for now because we'll go on to that a lot. You know, There will be a lot of chat about variety and native plants and various things. So I'll go into more detail later. Um, I've put mulch chip here. So once you've planted your hedgerow, it can be a good idea to mulch around the bases just to stop any competition from other plants coming through and give your hedgerow the best chance. Um, rather than using a mulch or a chip, what I like to do is in the autumn, if you collect up all of your leaf litter from all the trees shedding their leaves, um, just leaving some of that leaf litter in your garden is fantastic for wildlife or scoop it up into a pile, which is also good for wildlife, and then use that leaf litter as your mulch to stop other plants coming through and out competing your hedge potentially. You know, keep it all natural, keep it within your garden, introduce as little as possible that you have, have to, and you know, use the habitats and everything that's in your garden already is probably the best way that I like to do it really. So plant options. There are many, many plant options out there. But some of the things to consider is the age of the plants. I think what puts off a lot of people from planting a mixed native hedge rather than say an ornamental or conifers and things like that is the size and the length of time that it takes to mature. You know, people like a hedgerow as a screen often. 
So there are lots of um, options out there. You don't have to buy really young new whips. You can buy older plants. Obviously, they will be more expensive. And so you've got to take that into consideration. But I've included this picture because these are really fantastic, like hedge troughs almost, um, and provide screening instantly. And they're just so attractive with a mix of plants. I just think they're fantastic. You know, you are investing a little bit more money, but you're getting that instant screening without then the worry of like conifers that are going to grow incredibly tall really quickly and become a problem uh, soon after that. There are lots of options still with consuming plants, bare root or root ball. You just have to really do your research and have a look in your area and what was going to be right for your garden. And it all depends on budget. But always, if you can, try and get that, those native plants and a mixture of them is always best for wildlife. So what are some of those native plants? Well, here's just a few to consider. In the top left there, we've got blackthorn and next to it, hawthorn, the key base to any hedgerow, I would say. Here we've got a very mature um, hazel, which is always lovely in a hedgerow and also really good for using the stakes. Uh, the, the branches are really good for using as stakes and binders when doing hedge laying as well. And then we've got field, field maple down here and then dog rose and well as holly, which obviously provides cover all year round. But it's not just about, about those native woody plants. It's also really good to encourage sort of those creeping and shrubby area elements as well. So I've actually included uh, bramble down here, which is really good for wildlife, but also ivy. These are really uh, important as well. You know, You'd, if you don't want to have them in your garden hedgerow, then you don't have to. But I'm here to tell you that if they do creep into your garden and creep into your hedgerow, then it's no bad thing. Don't feel like you have to get rid of them. Like bramble is a fantastic food source for a variety of wildlife, it provides flowers early on in the spring and then fruit right into the autumn. Ivy provides winter berries and winter nectar to a lot of invertebrates that would struggle to find it elsewhere. So while considered a problem in gardens at times when it gets out of control, it can be really beneficial for wildlife. And if you are thinking about encouraging more wildlife into your garden, then I would definitely consider it. And this is actually a holly blue butterfly. Name is a bit of a giveaway. They uh, are very much associated with holly, but also with ivy. So if you want to attract these guys to your garden, you're going to need holly or ivy. So just still building on that native and mix and variety of hedgerow, I thought I would use the hazel dormouse as an example. So hazel dormouse, while the name suggests that they feed exclusively on hazel, it's not actually the case. Hazelnuts are only available in the autumn and they actually require quite a diverse um, diet to be able to be successful. So taking you on a year in the life of a dormouse, they wake up in the spring and they start feeding on blackthorn blossom and flowers going on to hawthorn when they're available. As spring develops and you go into summer, they move on to ash keys and other seeds and things they can find, as well as other blossoms and flowers like wild honeysuckle flowers. As the summer goes on, they'll also try and find little invertebrates uh, such as these aphids. And then as we go into the autumn, they're feeding a lot on blackberry, uh, not blackberry, brambles and blackberries, as well as, of course, those hazelnuts, which are only available in the autumn. So that is an incredibly diverse diet that they need to find a lot of different things throughout the year. And not a lot of habitats might have all of that available, but all of these things can be found in a hedgerow. So they're quite a uh, high maintenance little creature, but they're so cute that we let them get away from it. But all of these foods can be found in a mixed native hedge, which is why hedgerows are so important to dormice as well. So I know that some people will be thinking, I can't have a hedgerow, I don't have the space, I don't have the time. Um, and there's a, the other option, if you do want to try and provide that continuity in your garden and connect up different habitat types, is really consider a dead hedge. You know, maybe not the most attractive name in the world and not what most people would think of, but there's a lot of benefits to dead hedges. Um, they're a lot less maintenance. 
you can keep adding to them. So once material starts to break down, you can keep adding to it, um, saves you trips to the tip or other buildup of garden waste elsewhere. And it doesn't have to be massive. I've included this picture at the bottom to show you. It doesn't have to be a particularly large area. It, you can form it however you like and put it wherever you like. And it will still perform a lot of features that a hedgerow will. You're going to provide that connection in your garden. They'll be able to move through. Be providing habitat. You know, you could have hedgehogs in there. Lots of invertebrates. Birds will be hunting in there. So, you know, you're not providing all the same elements of a living hedge. But I mean, a dead hedge is a fantastic option for those that don't think a hedgerow might be right for them. I can save you a lot of work in your garden. And here's just an example of some dead hedging that we did on one of our nature reserves, um, Westfield Common. So we did a lot of holly removal and rather than burn the holly or remove it and put it in landfill or take it away elsewhere, we left it on site and built it into dead hedges and we have provided more continuity through the woodland. We've also kind of protected areas, so natural screening to stop people going in places. And it's been really successful and the locals have loved it and thought it's a really attractive feature. So yeah, a nice example, a nice option for those not wanting a hedgerow. So just to talk about a few other species that are really going to benefit from hedgerows, bats are a big one. So bats are really reliant on linear landscape features like hedgerows and waterways and woodland edges, and it helps to form their commuting routes and really aids their nav navigation when they're using echolocation. Not only that, it also provides fantastic shelter and roosting opportunities. So if they've gone too far on a night or they get caught out, weather's bad, they can rest up and take shelter and roost overnight in a hedgerow before making their way back to the main roost the next night. And a network of well-connected hedgerows and other linear features within a landscape allows many species of bat to even extend that foraging and roosting capacity. So the more connected our landscape is, the further bats can go, and the more connected it is, and the less likely they are to get disorientated. Obviously, hedgerows are also a fantastic habitat for insects, and that's what bats are almost exclusively feeding on. So the more insects and the more habitat we can provide for that, the more we can benefit those creatures further up the food chain like bats. Obviously, we couldn't talk about hedgerow wildlife without mentioning the hedgehog. And they very much are inhabitants of edge habitat. So woodland edge and hedgerows, you know, gardens. It's not surprising that they are so frequently found in our gardens. They like that like variety and moving around on edge. So a really good hedgerow for a hedgehog is one with a thick base and a wide margin. So in a garden capacity, if you've got your hedgerow and then it's butting up against the flower bed and it's left to go wild around the edges, your hedgehogs are going to absolutely love that because they don't like coming out into open ground. They will avoid gaps as best as possible. You know, if you see hedgerows in your garden, they're normally snuffling around the edge, um, very rarely making it making their way out into the middle of the garden. It does happen, but when they're moving around, they're trying to protect themselves, avoiding predators. So they need as much linking habitat as possible so that they can extend their foraging routes as well. Obviously birds massively benefiting from hedgerows, loads of them are associated with hedgerows. Um, tall hedges equals like more habitat and more breeding um, territories. Can't always just allow your hedge to go mad in a garden setting, but a few little wild bits and bobs is always good for them. Uh, scrubby open woodland species use hedgerows as well and they're not just using them for breeding in or hiding in they're also using them as perches so you'll quite often see a blackbird singing from the top of a tree or a hedgerow you know they like these perching opportunities where they can defend their territory or watch out for predators and not only that they're often using the hedge base as well you know birds will use all elements of a hedgerow so you get a lot of ground nesting birds like robins and wrens and you'll likely to find them like squirreled away in the base of your hedge. Last year I even found a blue tit nest at the base of a large mature hazel. So all kinds of species will utilise the bases of hedgerows if they're well managed. Obviously we've already mentioned it a fair bit, <laughs> the invertebrates 
really rely on hedgerows and these kind of features and a well-managed one you'll just find the invertebrates in your garden you know beneficial pollinators interesting ones like stag beetles and things like that will just go up and up with hedgerows and scrubby areas in your garden obviously the hedgerow provides a fantastic supply of food shelter breeding sites again invertebrates are so small they inhabit such small niches the more variety you provi provide the more invertebrates will move in to utilize all of those different areas and microhabitats. Not only that, but they use them for all sorts of things that you might not think. So for example, bumblebees use hedgerows to guide for foraging activities, turn to the same places where they found nectar before. Um, more than 20 species of butterflies have been found to breed in hedgerows. And it's not only birds that use hedgerows for perching opportunities, peacock butterflies will also use it as territorial perching sites to ward off other butterflies and even the odd bird if they're feeling brave enough. So hopefully at this point you're thinking, wow, hedgerows are pretty incredible and they're doing so much and providing so much wildlife, but you might also be thinking, how? How is you know, the humble hedgerow able to do all of this? Well, you know, all of this variety and the different wildlife that they're um, supporting is all of that biodiversity. And what's key to biodiversity is variety. So those different niches, those different micro habitats and habitat types. So all of this can only really be achieved through good management. You know, it's fantastic to have a hedgerow, do plant a hedgerow in your garden, but if you really wanna maximize that variety, then you need to provide as many different niches and opportunities and that happens through good management. So the management that you're trying to achieve is to get these different hedgerow components. So I'm going to just go through those different components quickly with you as well. And those are standing trees, so leaving a few species to mature and provide that different height structure, as well as the shrubby layer, the hedge bottom, bank and ditches and also the hedge margin. So hedgerow trees, really great to have hedgerow trees. Again, if you're in a garden setting, you might not be able to do this, but you might be able to just leave one or two species in your hedgerow to just mature a little bit more, get a bit bigger than the rest of your hedge, which is fantastic too. It provides those vantage points, those perching opportunities for birds and butterflies and other species. And certain species are really reliant on tree species in general. So like the brown hair streak butterfly is really found to be in those hedgerow trees and lays their eggs amongst the hawthorn branches as well. Birds sing and display from those trees, you know, just in the same way they use regular trees, but also really useful to have them in hedgerows, nesting holes and other opportunities for birds. So that scrubby component, this is the element that we really think of when we think hedgerow. Um, and this is really needs to be kept as bushy and thick as possible and forms that bulk of the hedge. The dense cover provided by this well-managed scrubby area is really important because it provides that dense cover for lots of wildlife. And the denser and thicker it is, the more stuff is likely to use it because it will see it as protection from predators as well, which is why management is so important. And there's a diff lots of different ways that you can manage that hedgerow. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So keeping that scrubby element is so important because we are seeing that decline in the quality because there's that lack of understanding around how to manage a hedgerow well. And with that decline in quality of those bushy areas, we also see a decline in species using it or benefiting from it. And if the interior of the hedgerow is more open, it's much more open to the elements, but also exposed to predators, which would want to try and provide the best cover and the best habitat for our wildlife as possible. And there's been a decline in a lot of those kinds of species, but on, from a farmland setting, turtle dove, bullfinch, linnet, tree sparrows, a variety of things that use hedgerows. But uh, that's why we're spending so much time educating people on how to better look after their hedgerows, not just in gardens, but also countryside, la other land management. And so we're going to see much bushier hedgerows throughout Surrey, hopefully over the next few years. So moving on to the hedgerow base, um, kind of just highlights how many different elements there are to a hedge. And if you've got different habitats, even microhabitats, there will be wildlife that will exploit it and use it. 
And actually the base of hedgerows is important to 41% of our prior, uh, biodiversity, like priority species are BAP species. So by those that have a biodiversity action plan attached to them. You know, it helps to form that safe highway as well as being a breeding opportunity. So newts, frogs, toads, invertebrates, hedgehogs, all sorts are hunting along that base of the hedge or using it as well, that kind of damper, darker area. And they really help, hedge bases really help to form that buffer zone to protect root systems of the hedgerow as well. So you might be doing everything to manage your hedgerow at the top well, not cutting it too often. You may have even laid it, but if that root system isn't well protected as well, it can damage it without you even realizing. So again, more species benefiting at the base, reed buntings nest close to the bases of hedgerows as well as other ground nesting species and further helps to develop that barrier to predators as well. And then the hedgerow margin, which is one of my favourite um, parts of the hedgerow, which is technically not even, you know, not made up of those hedgerow species. It often gets forgotten, but it really helps to protect the hedge, but also enhance it by having that thick, tussocky, grassy, wild area around the base of your hedge. You're not only protecting your hedgerow, you're also enhancing that hedge habitat, providing lots more foraging opportunities, hideaway spots for wildlife, and just generally enhancing it. And I think there's nothing more beautiful than a lovely hedge with a thick area at the base with all sorts of wildlife using it. So the margins have been found to be important for 34% of biodiversity action plan species, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's much higher in reality. It's obviously nectar and pollen, seeds and invertebrates for all sorts. So, you know, it's a hunting ground for all, but also a hideaway for lots of things as well. Not only that, but harvest mice love to build their nests in tall vegetation in this kind of hideaway area. So who wouldn't want to help the adorable little harvest mouse? Um, well, that's all of the components of the hedgerow that we were going to talk about, but also deadwood is really important and plant litter. And again, it's helping to protect that hedgerow. Deadwood is a fantastic habitat in its own right, really valuable for invertebrates. And if you're looking after things at the bottom of the food chain, then you're helping everything that's further up as well. It provides all of that food for those other things, but not only the food for mammals and everything up the food chain, it's also providing cover for small mammals. You can imagine little mice and voles running around in there as well. And again, further helping to protect the base and root systems of your hedgerow. So I keep mentioning it, but diversity is key. Variety in your hedgerow will bring in more variety of wildlife. So lots of different features appeal to lots of different wildlife. The more diverse in composition, the more species it can support and you can bring into your garden. And Obviously, this is aided by having that variety of native species and it is achieved by good management. And I know I've kept saying good management. I hope that doesn't put people off because once you have the understanding of the management, it doesn't actually have to be particularly onerous. I think a big problem that people have with hedgerows at the moment is that most of them are overmanaged. So I'm here to tell you that you can put the clippers away and not do as much potentially. But what was also key is that hedgerows can't do it on their own. They do need some help. So one way that you can manage your hedge is through hedge laying, which is what I will be doing a lot of in the uh, winter, the autumn and winter. Because again, it is a very much a winter and autumn activity. You can't lay your hedge in the spring and summer. It will, if it doesn't kill it, it won't do it any favors. Let's put it that way. You need to do it when the sap isn't running through the stems. By lay, we mean like putting a cut through the base, but not severing it and laying the plant over. So it may seem quite brutal that those who haven't uh, potentially experienced it in the past, but it actually helps to regenerate the plant. By having this stress, it helps it put up new, new growth and lots more stems. And we describe this as it coppices. So more stems, bushier plant, creates more structure and diversity in the hedgerow. And it can quite often be a way of saving a dying hedge. So this is a hedge that I was laying with some others at Surrey Wildlife Trust in the autumn. And it's actually an elm hedge. And obviously a lot of you will have heard of Dutch elm disease. And you can see some of the death and the decay in these long stems. And if this hedge had just been left 
the, um, it was probably going to succumb and it was really on its last legs. But by treating it like this, we will encourage it to put on lots of new growth, new stems, and it will reinvigorate that hedge and those plants. So you've made all the effort, you've laid the hedge and you think you're done right now. Wrong, unfortunately, you do still need to think about ongoing management, but this can be really sympathetic and it will just still help to extend that life. So just cutting it every three, two, three, even five years, depending on where it is, it depends on how quickly it's growing. You can just cut it back, encourage that in more, that better growth in different places will really help to invigorate your hedge and keep it going for longer and longer and being bushy for years and years and years. So I mentioned it already, over management is a really big problem with hedgerows. Like quite often we see a lot of hedgerows being cut at the same point um, every single year and you get these knuckles is what we describe it as. And you can just see where it's being cut back. It's all quite grown, you know, sort of extended and it can lead to it becoming quite bottomless. It leads to real deterioration of the hedge. It kind of bottoms out and get this mushroom shape and it's slowly dying, unfortunately. So that constant long-term trimming at the same height really stresses the hedge. So we want to encourage people to cut less often, maybe just cut one side part of your hedge so you've got that different structure and age and uh, really kind of work with your hedgerow rather than just cutting to the same regimented point every single year. And so a good way to look at it is this lifestyle approach. So recognize and value the life cycle of a hedgerow, understand it a little bit better. And quite often a healthier hedge may not be the neatest hedgerow in the world, but it will be, I think, much more beautiful. We all seem to be letting our gardens go a little bit more wild. We don't need quite the same manicured lawn. Hopefully a lot of you have heard of no mow may and encouraging that wildlife, a few more flowers into our gardens and a bit more into our hedgerows is kind of the way that the trends are going anyway. So I think it's really attractive. And what you're trying to do with this lifestyle approach um, with trimming your hedge and looking after your head is slowing down, but not altogether halting the natural changes that the hedgerow want to go through. So at the start, I mentioned like natural succession, but by Doing this on all hedgerows, we're, holding, we're hoping to achieve that ideal mosaic of different shapes and sizes that make our garden so special. So, you know, different heights in part of your hedge, some bits are being left to flower, some bits are a little bit taller than others, and wildlife will just go, wow, so much variety, and you'll bring lots more in. So I've done a lot of talking at you all or at blank screens for me, which is always still, and no matter how many webinars I do, it's always a little bit strange not getting uh, reactions from people when you're talking. So I hope that hasn't been too much, but you may be a little bit overwhelmed with all of the information that we've talked about. You know, a lot of, I do a whole hour long presentation about managing hedgerows and the wildlife that benefits. So this is very much a kept down version, but I thought we'd just quickly run through Katie's big top 10 management tips for hedgerows to sum it all up. So number one, keep it thick and dense. Close interwoven branches will be very appealing to wildlife, it provides that safe sanctuary, nesting, roosting opportunities, hiding places, and all sorts of wildlife will benefit from this. And lots of birds, obviously. Open hedges attract more predators, so you're trying to avoid that. And holly can be a really good uh, addition to a hedgerow because it's an evergreen and will help to provide that compact, dent bushes all year round for you. Cut at the right time, and the right time is late winter. Berries and other fruit provide vital food for birds as well as other as well as other animals. But obviously, field fare, red wings, and other thrushes are a fantastic addition to our gardens in the winter. And anyone who has berries or trees with berries on will know about having like that one day where all of the field fare or all of the red wing descend on your garden um, and strip everything bare. So as much food as you can leave for things, the better. The earlier you cut the less food is available. And never cut your hedge during the breeding bird season, which runs from the 1st of March to the 1st of September. I'm still really surprised at how many people don't know that it's actually illegal to cut your hedge during these times because birds are protected in this country. 
if you really desperately need to cut it back for like access reasons or things like that, try and have a look and see if you do have any birds in nests in your hedgerow. There's nothing worse than disturbing them when they have chicks in the nest or even eggs. Don't cut too often or too tight. So just try and cut once every two, three years, maybe even longer, depending on the how quickly that hedge is growing. Try and not cut it at the same point every year. So cut different bits, don't cut back to the same knuckle. Let it grow up and out a little bit. Um, alternatively, just cut one side or the top and alternate this every two to three years. So you're keeping some of it under control, but letting other bits go wild and try and leave occasional berry for fruit or um, berry or fruit bearing trees so that you're providing that food all year round for wildlife. And so just an example there, one mature hawthorn can provide as many berries as 200 meters of hedgerow, which are cut every year. So that kind of puts it into perspective just how much food there is in the hedgerow and how much you're taking away if you cut it too often. Encourage, encourage native shrubs, easy for me to say. So you're aiming for a range of different species which provide food throughout the year. If you can provide food and opportunity for wildlife all year round, you'll have wildlife in your garden all year round. Willows and blackthorn for really early season nectar, you know, blackthorn are one of the first of the trees or shrubby species we see in blossom, which is beautiful. Hawthorn, bramble and rose for summer flowers and autumn berries and ivy for autumn nectar and late winter berries. And you've got a whole year of food in your garden just like that. Um, encourage flowers and grasses at the base and margins. So again, you could just by having a flower bed at the base of your garden, really fantastic. And that vegetation supports lots more wildlife. Primrose, knapweed provide nectar and pollen for bees and other pollinators and beneficial invertebrates while tussocky grasses provide safe places for beetles, spiders and the like during winter. Frogs, toads, newts, lizards, all sorts um, benefit from that dense growth at the base of hedgerows for food and cover. So you're providing a lot by letting things go a little bit wild or having some flowers at the base of the hedgerow as well. So look after those hedgerow trees or plant new ones. Big mature trees, especially native ones like oak, ash and beech, will increase the amount of wildlife that use the hedge tremendously. Not everyone's going to be able to do this, obviously, but if you can, then fantastic. Insects can uh, congregate around the canopy, you see lots of wildlife there, you probably have to get your binoculars out. But if you're like me, I do sit and watch stuff in the summer uh, congregating around the tops of trees. But even small trees like holly, rowan and crabapple are also very valuable and lots of flowers and berries rich and benefit lots of things. So again, you know, not everybody can have those giant trees in their garden, but here's an example potentially of one in that garden setting. So you've got maybe a fruit tree here, which is very beneficial to wildlife and slightly wilder areas of that garden hedgerow as well. Rejuvenate your hedge. So to keep them bushy for many years, just by cutting them back occasionally. Don't just leave them to just become mature trees. You do need to cut them back a bit. Um, if you want to lay them, they need to be cut close to ground level so they can send up new crop of stems and begin a fresh, healthy life cycle of growth. But this won't work for evergreens like conifers. So do may take care to plant the right species. So lots of people do pick conifers and other species and plant types that are considered to be really good for screening. This isn't always the right way to go. You might get an instant hit, but then they become so fast growing and um, they become very difficult to maintain and quite high maintenance can lead to neighbour disputes or issues even with like house boundaries and foundations and things like that. So do think really carefully before picking your shrubs and trees. And luckily native ones will not grow this quickly. And obviously after this talk, none of you are gonna be considering planting a conifer hedge anyway. Do try and link the hedge with other habitats and fill gaps and links in your garden. Like we said, wildlife doesn't really like open spaces. So link it to other parts of your garden, perhaps a pond, flower bed or woodland area, depending on where you are, and helps to provide that safe passage for wildlife, both in rural areas, urban, suburban, and just linking up the habitat in your garden. And 10, by no, by no means the least, and maybe one of the most important, explore your hedge and enjoy it. 
Hedgerows are a joy and they are teeming with life. So enjoy it, see what's living in there, notice the blackbirds nesting, see the sparrows flitting through it, you know, have a look at what invertebrates you're getting in there. Do enjoy it, that's what it's there for, people and wildlife. You know, have a look at which parts of your hedge are most favoured and it can really help to tailor your tinkering of your hedgerow and your gentle management. You know, is that flowering hawthorn really attracting lots of things so you're not going to cut it back for another year? You're allowing that ivy to creep in because you're seeing the ivy bees enjoying it in the autumn and winter. You know, enjoy it, tailor your management to it and yeah, enjoy it as much as you can. So that's it from me. And the last thing I'll say is that thank you so much for all coming along to the talk. I did mention that I am the Hedro Heritage Project Manager. We have now launched our Hedro Survey app. So if any of you would like to get involved with doing a little bit of volunteering and surveying hedgerows in your local area, or even adding a hedgerow that you have in your garden to our fantastic interactive hedgerow map, then please do get in touch, drop me an email, um, we're running lots of different training sessions now to get people trained up on how to do it. And um, we're really looking to change that lack of data that we have about our hedgerows and how we can move forward. And I'm really excited about everything that we're achieving already. So keep watching this space. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You were so motivating. Would you like to take, would you like to take that off the screen and we can open up um, to see if, if people are welcome to turn their screens back on if you like. Um, don't be shy. If you have some questions, please do let us know. Um, we've had a couple of people saying how wonderful your uh, chat was and thank you very much for that. Um, let's see if we've got, uh, cheers Katie, um, had to go back to work. Okay, so <laughs> Christine has a question for you. When is the best time to prune a holly tree? And thank you, she's learned a lot. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Um, I would say probably in the winter again. So I would say late, late winter, maybe January, February time. So you've left the holly berries on for as long as possible. So you've provided food in the winter for as long as possible, but you're also not cutting your hedge in breeding bird season. Okay, very good point. Very good point. Um, I have a question for you. Um, we had a little chat about uh, planting hedges that didn't quite work. Preparing the soil when you um, are planting some of these. I put bone meal in, but is there other um, things that you should do to prepare the soil other than clearing out the area? Um, so I'm not an expert on, uh, on that kind of side of things, but one area that I am really interested in and learning more about is some of people will have heard of the book, The Hidden Life of Trees, yeah. and that wood wide web that they have going on and the intimate relationship they have with mycelium and different fungi species. And I think you can put down a mix of like mycelium to encourage that root growth and interaction with other trees nearby and things like that. So that would probably be my number one recommendation if I was planting one. Okay, that's a good point, good point. Um, it looks like you were so good at answering all everyone's questions, there isn't any other further questions coming in. Um, so, so basically, Katie, thank you for everything. I hope everyone's motivated. Everyone's gonna go out and get um, some planting going because this we are doing a lot of talk about wildlife gardening right now, and this is a key element to that. Um, but also that survey, um, I think that could be a really interesting way of people getting involved. Um, so uh, from Surrey Wildlife Trust, we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and this is gonna be um, available um, both on the website and on YouTube, if you want to tell people. Um, someone's just, come, Alex has just said, thank you very much. Um, I'll have a look at the hedgerow survey too. Thank you, Alex, that sounds great. Um, and he was just thinking about the uh, habitat management as a career. So you are motivating, Katie. <laughs> Good luck um, with all of that, Alex. Someone, someone has just asked for my email address. So I'm going to put it in the chat for people. If anyone wants to message about joining the uh, joining as a volunteer, so let me just put that in. Apparently, I can't write my email without saying it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, does everybody see that? 
So yeah, there's my email address. And also if you want to sign up as a volunteer with the trust, you can tick your interest at Hedro Heritage and it will come to me and we can get you signed up. We're, the surveying is really simple. You come to one, uh, one training session and we get you all set up on how to use the app. So it's all done through an app. And then you can do as much or as little surveying as you like. And it all just goes into our interactive map. You can have a look at which hedgerows you'd like to survey. You can add your own hedgerows into the map and you can do it all in your free time. So around work and other commitments. Fantastic. Well, um, I'm motivated. I hope all you are. So um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, thank you, Katie, for, for spending the time with us. Um, and thank you for once again having me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always, always. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, hope to see you again soon.